This lab tutorial is meant to go over or provide guidance to you on solving problem number one in the study guide for the gravimetric analysis experiment. Here's the problem as it appears in the study guide of the Chem 110 lab manual. It deals with the calculations which have to be performed on the acquired data in order to obtain the desired result in this experiment. But before going over this problem, I think it's better to first go over the basic chemistry of what's involved in the first part of your gravimetric analysis experiment. Because if we understand the basics of the chemistry involved in this type of analysis, then I think we can have a better understanding of how we can perform calculations on the acquired data to determine our result. Now, if you're already okay with the basic chemistry involved in this lab and just want to get right down to reviewing the method of calculation, then just go ahead and watch the second tutorial on gravimetric analysis. Otherwise, I think it's a good idea for you to watch the rest of this first tutorial and get a basic understanding of the underlying chemistry. Okay, so let's get rid of the problem for now. Remember that we are just going to go over the basic chemistry of this first. If you are familiar with the basic chemistry, then go ahead and view the tutorial number two. But for now, this is just the basic chemistry. So the objective of this first experiment on gravimetric analysis is to determine the percent of carbonate, that's CO3, in an unknown sample. Now what we really mean by an unknown sample is a soluble carbonate containing sample, sample that will dissolve in water. What might it be? Well, uh, there are not many soluble carbonates, but uh, sodium carbonate is a likely candidate. Uh, potassium carbonate is also a likely candidate. So those are a couple of examples of what they might be. Or it could be a mixture of carbonates. We don't know. But what we have to find out in this experiment is the percentage of carbonate in the sample. So for purposes of explanation here, let's just call the unknown carbonate M2CO3, where the M part of the molecule is, well, we don't know what it is. It could be sodium, it could be potassium, uh, it could be a mixture of those. We really don't know. All we know is that it's a soluble carbonate sample. So you're going to start with a solid sample of that. So we'll subscript in parenthesis here an S. The very first thing you're going to do in this experiment, or one of the very first things you're going to do, is you're going to determine the mass of the sample that you are analyzing. You're going to be instructed to weigh out on the analytical balance a uh, uh, precisely known mass of the unknown. Now, when you've weighed out the sample, one of the next things you're going to do is you're going to dissolve the sample in water. Uh, so you're going to produce uh, what we would call an aqueous solution of your carbonate. You're going to dissolve all of it in water. Now, one of the key things for this type of analysis, for this type of analysis to be successful, is you must ensure that all of the solid is dissolved in the water to produce your aqueous solution of unknown carbonate. You're going to add to that uh, an aqueous solution of a precipitating agent. Now the precipitating agent that you're going to use uh, in this experiment is a solution of calcium chloride, an aqueous solution of calcium chloride. So it's aqueous we're showing that by subscripting in brackets here an AQ. So do remember that these are aqueous solutions and there is no associated species in either of these solutions. So for example, the uh, unknown carbonate solution contains the uh, cations, the unknown uh, cations, whatever they might be, sodium or potassium or whatever, and it also includes uh, carbonate ions, CO3 2 minus ions. The same goes with the calcium chloride solution. 
the aqueous solution contains calcium ions and contains chloride ions. So when we add the aqueous solution of calcium chloride to the aqueous solution of the unknown carbonate, what's going to be produced is solid calcium carbonate. So we show that with a subscripted S here. Now, solid calcium carbonate is formed because calcium carbonate is highly insoluble in water. So it will, we say, precipitate out of solution. It will form a solid and we'll be left with an aqueous solution of some uh, unknown uh, chloride, aqueous solution. So we have the solid calcium carbonate here. And remember, this is an aqueous solution of unknown cations and the chloride ions. Now this equation, this equation here, let's call it equation one, is a perfectly acceptable way of indicating the chemistry involved in this determination. But a better way is to write it out in a simpler form. So in a simpler form, we would write this equation so that it includes only the species which are taking part in the chemical reaction involved, because we're really not interested in the other species, spectator ion. So a simpler way of representing the chemistry in this reaction is to write out this equation here. So we have the calcium ions from the aqueous solution of calcium chloride reacting with the carbonate ions from the aqueous solution of the unknown carbonate, and of course they are going to produce the solid calcium carbonate, which is precipitating out of solution. So this is a much simpler way of depicting the chemistry in this reaction. And we call this the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation is the equation that includes only the species which are reacting. Now, it's very important for us to understand in this type of analysis, if we want to get an accurate result, it's very important that we make sure, absolutely sure, that we use an excess of the precipitating agent, in this case, the calcium chloride or the calcium ions. That's absolutely essential. In that way, the carbonate ion, the species that we are analyzing for, is what we call the limiting, the limiting reagent. The limiting reagent is a reagent which gets used up completely. This is a balanced equation here. So the stoichiometry of this reaction is one to one, one mole of calcium ions, will react with one mole of carbonate ions to produce a mole of calcium carbonate. So for every mole of carbonate ions that we have, we need at least a mole of calcium ions to make sure that all of the carbonate ions are removed and precipitated as calcium carbonate. This is absolutely essential in this analysis that all of the carbonate ions that are in solution here end up as carbonate in the solid calcium carbonate. Now, once the calcium carbonate has been precipitated, the experiment involves filtering this out and washing the precipitate and then drying it. All of those experimental details we'll get to during the course of the lab. But for now, once the calcium carbonate has been obtained and cleaned up and dried, one of the very last steps in this experiment is to determine the mass of the calcium carbonate. So you'll weigh that on an analytical balance. So at the end of the experiment, you will end up with a known mass of a known carbonate, in this case, calcium carbonate. Whereas at the beginning of the experiment, you started with a known mass of an unknown carbonate. And do uh, please keep in mind that all of the carbonate that we start with up here, using proper techniques and so on, ends up here and it ends up here. Okay, So the carbonate that we begin with, the CO3 that we begin with, we end up with in the calcium carbonate. 
So this, in fact, means, and we're going to come to this next, is that the, the mass of carbonate here must equal the mass of carbonate at the beginning. Okay, so knowing that, let's just write that down here. The mass of carbonate in the calcium carbonate that we weigh at the end of the experiment must be the same as the mass of carbonate in the unknown, provided no losses have uh, occurred during the experiment. And of course, we take steps to ensure that is the case. So the mass of carbonate in the calcium carbonate uh, must be equal to the mass of the calcium carbonate itself, which we've just weighed, times the molar mass of CO3 divided by the molar mass of calcium carbonate. The ratio of those two molar masses times the mass of calcium carbonate will give us the mass of CO3 in the calcium carbonate. That's this mass up here. So knowing that is the same as the mass of the CO3 in the original carbonate, we can now calculate the percent CO3 carbonate in the original sample. And that would be the mass of CO3 that we've just determined in the calcium carbonate, which is the same as the mass of CO3 in the unknown carbonate. Divide that by the mass of the uh, unknown carbonate and of course multiply it by 100 and that will give us the result that we're looking for that will give us the percent of carbonate in the original sample so that about covers the basic chemistry in this experiment you should now uh, Take a look at the second tutorial on gravimetric analysis, which shows you how the calculations can be done on the data that has been acquired.